All right. Welcome. Happy Friday, Retreat Leader Hub. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're watching from. Um, I'm Jen, and today I am thrilled to be joined by uh, Sahara Rose DeVore. Um, and so welcome, Sahara. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it's great. And I, I think our topic is on point for a lot of our uh, group members. Um, so we can dive right in. Uh, I wanted to first just quickly read uh, Sahara's bio so you guys have a sense for who she is and what she's all about. Um, she's got a ton of experience in the wellness industry, especially as it relates to bringing greater wellness to those who work in the corporate world. Um, she is a wellness travel coach and the founder of the Travel Coach Network. Um, after traveling the globe, including more than 84 four countries, that's impressive. Um, she now educates and empowers business travelers and corporate employees to travel with purpose and improve their well-being and work performance. She's been in over 60 media outlets, including Forbes, Business Insider, and USA Today. Um, so really cool resume. Uh, thanks for sharing those details. And normally I might have asked Sahara to focus more on travel specifically, but given what's going on in the world right now, uh, I think a lot of our audience members are trying to be creative in trying to diversify their offerings um, and their client base. So this talk is gonna give some kind of actionable advice as it relates to all kinds of wellness offerings, whether you're a coach or a yogi or a meditation teacher or therapist. Um, and it's gonna hopefully be relevant to not only destination-based retreats, but also virtual ones uh, and trainings, immersions, classes, all that good stuff. So welcome, Sahara. Um, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks again for having me. Yeah. Okay. If we dive into the first question then. Let's go. All right. So the first thing I wanted to ask about is what sorts of companies and organizations make good corporate clients? Um, kind of how do you figure out who might be receptive to your offering? Do you think mainly about uh, the business or organization type size, if they've in the past spent money in this area, what their state of values are, kind of other other considerations? What do you generally look for? Yeah, that's actually that's a really good question. Um, first of all, it's always really important to see if the company aligns with your values and resonates with you uh, with your mission. Um, you obviously the best results you're going to get is if the two companies align uh, with the same, uh, a similar end goal in mind, which could be focusing on well-being or enhancing an experience for the consumer, whatever that might be. So some things that you can do, uh, especially now, are play around on line and do, I just say do research. And that is a pretty broad uh, piece of advice. But what I mean by that is read articles, look at company blogs, um, even in uh, 2019, and see what they were thinking about creating for or implementing for their company. And maybe someone was headed in the direction of a wellness program or wellness initiative, but then 2020 happened. And 2020 accelerated a lot of these really important aspects of not only the travel industry or wellness industry, but in life in general. So focusing on our overall uh, mental well-being, physical well-being, uh, human connection, it kind of propelled a lot of these to the forefront of these different industries. So now companies are kind of in the sense, uh, the state now figuring out, well, how do we focus on the individual? So being able to kind of tap into what companies are talking about, what they represent, what their mission is, and see where you can implement yourself within there as the expert of whatever it is you focus on, whether it is strictly mental well-being, physical well-being, spirituality, uh, emotional um, intelligence. There's many different aspects, or even the travel space or destination-oriented. Um, that's a great way to kind of, I always say, find, when you do research, you can find a lot of comparisons, but it also opens doors to many voids. And when you can find voids, you can create a solution or you could fit yourself or insert yourself in to those voids where you're going to uh, create that solution, create that offer. And it could be something that the company hadn't really thought about yet, um, but they are definitely thinking about 
much more now uh, since COVID hit than they were uh, pre-pandemic. Yeah, that's great advice. I I love I I love the idea of coming to the table with some research done, whether that's through their social media, their blogs, their job postings. You know, just to get a sense for what the company is all about. Um, and also, I love the idea of looking back to 2019 to sort of get a snapshot of what you know in the more normalized world, kind of what was on managers' minds, because um, we all know, as you pointed out. COVID and, and, you know, basically emergency support has been on, on our minds for the last year or so, but um, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, my second question uh, is around when it comes to approaching larger companies or organizations as potential clients, uh, it's often sort of difficult to know who to get in touch with and how. Um, so who are generally the, the gatekeepers or the decision makers around uh, corporate wellness spending? Yeah, that's a, it's a little bit of a tricky question right now because even pre-COVID, roles were changing um, with the growth of the well-being aspect back across corporate wellness, business travel, which are two areas that I focus in, uh, was just starting to um, grow some traction. Roles were already changing. They were uh, companies who were trying to figure out whose role or responsibility is it to care about the individual's wants and needs and overall well-being of the traveler, of the consumer, whoever might be of the employee. Um, so because COVID happened and now a lot of things are emerging when it comes to the aspect of well-being or wellness, uh, there are different roles, which is actually a really good and a uh, good thing, a positive thing. There's many roles coming about like chief wellness officers, things that we've never really heard of before. I know some connections of mine, some friends of mine who are in these roles, they uh, pitch themselves and their expertise in the wellness space or travel space to companies, uh, whether it's meetings and events um, or uh, business booking uh, travel platforms. And the companies realized the importance of these roles and kind of gave it over and said, figure out these programs or this direction. So there's, I would, because there isn't a direct title to go to, there's always HR to use, um, you know, head of HR, head of uh, the travel managers, head of uh, program development, head of a wellness uh, program in whatever company it is that you are interested in talking to. And you can easily do that with tools like uh, Twitter or LinkedIn are going to be your best friends right now, building connections and really getting to know these individuals because a lot of them have really daunting tasks to figure out where to go from here and how to best formulate a, an environment, a company, a company culture, programs, and take care of the well-being and what that means for their employees or their consumers. So they're looking for fresh ideas. And so this is the, bre the best time to kind of just connect with anyone in those roles and uh, kind of get to see how you can best serve them. Yeah, that's great. The the kind of list of different titles that might be the appropriate um, points of contact are amazing. And I love what you shared about the fact that you have some friends and people in your network who have actually stepped into roles as director of wellness or head of wellness. Um, so that you know that could be another thing to pitch in the right you know the right setting or environment. Um, pitch your skills as somebody who could either be a full-time employee or a contracted employee, part-time um, helping businesses kind of ramp up their efforts if their stated values are totally right there, but they don't have someone specifically dedicated to it. That's another really creative idea for maybe uh, getting getting involved in bringing your offering to, to these businesses that have a need and a desire to grow in those areas. So yeah, really cool. I would say just put yourself out there and reach out. It doesn't hurt to ask. I was uh, actually a few months ago invited onto the risk management team for the Global Business Travel Association. And uh, pre-COVID risk management was strictly around cancellations or uh, sickness or bookings or whatever it might be. Even risk management is being redefined because of COVID, not only in the sense of COVID and how to keep 
uh, travelers safe and, and the things that could happen on a trip because of the pandemic. Um, but also they were bringing on wellness experts and saying, well, we see a connection here for risk management and wellness. Uh, because they didn't have a well-being community. And I reached out and asked, hey, I I'm interested in your well-being community. Do I didn't see one on your list. Do you have one? And they said, no, we don't. So they're already introducing new people or programs or um, parts of committees extended across many different organizations or companies because COVID has brought new attention to different of, the, uh, of these different important areas. Yeah, that's a great example. And I love that idea of like, just you know, it's all about the hustle, like get out there and get in front of people. In fact, that's exactly how we ended up connecting on LinkedIn. So um, <laughs> definitely uh, it can be a strategy that works if, you know, if like you, you've done it in a thoughtful way and sort of approach people um, with with some value to add. So that's, that's amazing. Thank you. Um, thanks for giving that example uh, around the global um, excuse me, Business Travel Association too. That's that's cool. Um, going back to sort of like kind of process, I, I think the next point I would think naturally about is once you've identified the right point of contact or points of contact, um, can you give us sort of a rough outline of what a good playbook is from there? Kind of what are best practices in terms of initial messaging, follow-up and, and ultimately hopefully negotiating a deal? Yeah, absolutely. Um, once you've studied what that company of your interest does, really getting to understand the ins and outs of them and what they need, seeing what they offer, uh, and then realizing what they don't offer or what could you you might be able to help improve upon, um, being able to fill a void of theirs and um, offer a solution. I like to say you speak their language so they understand what it means um, that you resonate with their values. Once you're able to do that, uh, give a brief outline of what you can do, what you can provide. Uh, they might ask for some previous examples of uh, whether you do education sessions or trainings or webinars. They might ask for something to view of yours. So have that prepared and ready. Maybe it could be an online resource um, or anywhere that you've shared your information. Um, and then once you do that, this is a little bit of a tricky part, but it's really helpful if you can give some sort of quantitative reasons on the impact that you're going to make. So this might go into a little bit of your next question, I think, but those can include things like case studies or research or data, some sort of proof of, um, of profit or impact or results which can be tricky, uh, especially in the well-being sense, because there's companies are trying to figure out how to really measure the sense of well-being. Um, and COVID kind of threw a, a wrench in all senses of measurements when it comes to things like travel and wellness, right? So there's a lot of room for creativity here. So being able to figure out some sort of quantitative reasons um, of impact or results, and it will be very helpful. Uh, if you don't have any of that, look at past research or studies and say, well, this is, uh, these are, this is research found before. This is what I have done uh, in the past for myself when it comes to travel wellness. There's decades and decades of studies that show the mental health, physical health, and physiological health benefits of travel. Uh, things like how uh, there's been studies by like the Framingham Heart Association or the U.S. Travel Association and travel decreasing on uh, the risk of heart attack or heart failure in women who have gone on two, at least two trips a year. That a really specific research. So I did a lot, I spent a good amount of time doing this online research myself a few years ago, collecting a lot of this data that brings, uh, shines a light on the benefits that travel can provide. Um, and when I I found it really interesting that a lot of companies don't implement this type of information because it's really important. Um, so finding things like that in whatever is relative to you can be really helpful in building that support or pillars, I like to call, for your um, for what it is you talk about or offer. And then lastly, provide 
options on days that you can set up a call. Um, being able to make it as easy as possible for that point of connection and say, these are a couple options of days I'm available. If you have 15 minutes to jump on a call instead of kind of having the runaround of, well, when are you available? This is when I'm available. Are you available? Um, make it very clear cut and easy for them um, and having it very brief and, um, cl and clear of what it is that you can do and how you can benefit them. Yeah, that's great. And that did lead in, I was gonna ask um, uh, kind of about, evidence-based uh, kind of support you can provide either anecdotally or, or backed by data for your offering. So I think we touched well on that. It's something that I work with the Global Wellness Institute. Um, mm -hmm. And it's something that I know on the side of those that are working with corporate type partners is this whole concept of particularly tracking outcomes and, and kind of, for lack of a better word, return on investment um, for wellness spending. and. It's something that I think even a little bit of anecdotal evidence can go a long way because you may be talking to the decision maker, but they may have you know another committee or a boss that's ultimately going to sign off on it. So sort of like helping um, that decision maker ba bring a, a strong case to whoever is going to need to sign off on the decision. Essentially, um, and it makes you look really professional as as a prospective partner to be sort of like ready with that information in hand. So I think that's all, all really good advice. Um, one aspect of that process that I, I would love to dig into just a little tiny bit more is kind of on once you have sign on in concept and you're actually working out how to negotiate a deal. And I know this is highly situation specific but just talking through, if let's say it's your first foray into this as a wellness professional and you don't have sort of a standard scripted pricing, like I charge you know this much per one-on-one -on -one consult in an hour, how do you um, kind of go about some of those like contractual discussions? Uh, if you have any anything advice to share there based on personal experience, that would be awesome. Yeah, if you're starting off in whatever it is that you focus in, or it's a kind of a new uh, avenue for you, maybe you pivoted, pivoted a little bit during COVID, um, it's sometimes a good idea to kind of give your services for free, but offer some sort of exchange so that it's still a two-way road, um, maybe some sort of change of exposure, depending on where it is that you offer your services, whether it is a um, a, a collaboration or a partnership, um, a bigger company, it could be a smaller company, it could be a retreat company, um, it could be a, a one person run company. There's many different avenues to kind of make it a two way street. Um, that could be an exchange of exposure in front of their audience. It could be um, once travel safe and okay again, um, exchange for travel and accommodations. So there's different ways to kind of structure it. Um, you have to see what where your values lie. Is it more important to spread your message and grow your networking connections than it is to get paid X amount of dollars and kind of grow from there with the potential to land bigger contracts in the future? Um, so kind of weighing where your, um, your intent and your strategy lies. So education is key right now, um, being able to educate and empower and inspire on topics of wellness or, um, mental well-being, these different areas, or the benefits of a retreat, um, the impact, the social impact, the spiritual impact, whatever it is you believe in um, that you represent for your, your business. Spreading that message is really important. So sometimes um, being able to just provide value out there. Um, but once you um, are past that level or you um, do have a contract of some sort, um, having a structure, um, sometimes it's just whatever it might be to keep either you afloat. It's really financially um, personal of keeping your business afloat. What is the bare minimum that you want to make for, for the month, for the year, and how can you structure that? Um, if that's in, in um, connected to 
the importance of educating and gaining exposure and awareness for your business and your mission. Um, and then kind of going from there, it's, sometimes it's just a trial and error and learning process and a journey as you grow connections. Um, especially if it's in a, if you don't have, like we were talking about a lot of that quantitative support for results or profit, um, just being able to get your foot in the door and build those relationships um, and building some case studies is really important. So then you can now take this evidence and structure it into a contract that is actually profitable in the future. So kind of weighing where your values lie, what your strategy looks like and what's more important for you and your business. Yeah, those are, those are beautiful thoughts. I think the tension is for a lot of wellness professionals is that it's not, it's not necessarily the most high it, or it can be, but for a lot of us, it's not, we didn't get into this to make, you know, piles and piles of money as the major motivator. So balancing that, just like you said, making sure that it's it feels fair to you, that you feel good about what you're giving in exchange for what you're kind of receiving, that it's a two-way street. And I think if you are open to doing pro bono work, you know, one beautiful way to do that is to find um, an organization that, say, is doing great social justice work or um, humanitarian work or something like that and using you know, saying, if I'm going to donate my time, I'd love to support these employees who are doing really important work in the world. And, you know, if I do it at a free rate or super reduced rate and build my resume that way, you know, maybe that's another way that it feels like um, you're getting, you know, you're getting something out of it as well that that's yeah. compensating you fairly for your time. So those are all really good thoughts. I appreciate them. And another thing to think about is if you have different tiers in your offers, so maybe you're offering a at a corporate level um, pro bono, but then you build into your negotiation and exposure for another tier. So maybe on an individual employee level and um, you can gain clients or whatever it is you do offer purchases that way. Um, yeah. That has worked a lot in my business too, for both of my businesses. Um, so I want, I'm spreading, building connections, spreading awareness, um, building my, um, you know, my case studies. And then at the same time, still growing my network and my um, still making um, sales or getting clients on a different level of my business. That is a perfect segue into the question. I don't know if it was intended or not, but my last question um, is it something that's kind of really strategic about working with corporate clients or their kind of larger organizations is that they can introduce your offering to kind of a wider net of people um, in terms of in potential individual clients. So what are some of your strategies for cross-selling your, you know, your other offerings in a way that feels organic and appropriate, but, you know, hopefully doesn't jeopardize your it feels appropriate in the context of kind of the corporate relationship too. Yeah. Uh, usually if you, if you're both on the same page of um, that two way street, which a lot of corp people are um, and you come on for free and give a, let's say you do a training or a session for a corporate level and say, I'm willing to do that for free uh, pro bono. Uh, would you mind at the end that I share um, this with this resource or this avenue with th either the audience or for their uh, department? Um, and most likely they'll say, yeah, because you are coming on for free and you're still adding value to their um, to whatever resource or offer you're offering. So being able to clearly explain uh, the benefits of why this additional offer would be able to add value or maybe enhance the productivity or the well-being of their employees or whatever it might be. Maybe it's their clients um, and which will ultimately benefit them. So, sorry, my dog is barking. No worries. Um, yeah, so it's just kind of toying around with, with that. So, So toying around with that different, um, seeing what it is you do offer and who your ideal clients are. And if you do have those various tiers, how can you structure in a way that you're still maintaining, building and maintaining a genuine and uh, relationship on the corporate level, but still getting something out, out of this to possibly clients or sales um, with exposure to your other offers? 
Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, before we wrap up, I just wanted to ask you to share um, if our audience is learning, interested in learning more about you and the work you do through the Travel Coach Network, um, where can they find you? Yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, my website is the Travel Coach Network .com. I grew a global network of travel coaches with a certification program, but as for my own consulting and travel coaching in the wellness space for business travel and corporate wellness, right now you can still find me on that website. Um, my personal landing page is under construction at the moment, um, but you can still find me on there or email me at travels at gmail.com. Um, I'm Sahara Rose, the travel coach on Facebook and Instagram. All right. Awesome. I'll add all those into the chat um, so people can access them if they're watching later. And I think that that is the end. We're almost to 930. So thank you so much for joining us. I feel like I learned a ton during this talk and <laughs> oh, it was a pleasure you. speaking with you. So thank you so much. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thanks to everybody who's watching um, either now or if you're watching later. And um, with that, we'll sign off. Thank you so much, everybody. Take Bye, care. Everyone.